Good to see you all. Welcome, everybody. And a special welcome to Pastor Mario and uh, his wife, Sister Martha. Welcome back home. May God's blessing be on you this special day of Sabbath. While we are sitting in here enjoying God's presence, this world, our world, is sitting on a power keg. I'm sure you've seen it in the news, it's all over the place. Tensions are escalating in Eastern Europe between Russia and Ukraine. Now, many analysts would say that it's uh, not only a fight or quarrel among neighbors there, it's much more than that. It is a dissension, a tension that has been accumulated between Russia and NATO, or between the Russian Federation and the USA, rooted in the Cold War. Some even speak about Cold War II now. Of course, I'm not here to do politics and take sides, tell you who's right and who's wrong, but I'm here to tell you about a reality that cannot be denied when it comes to two superpowers fighting against one another. The problem is between those superpowers, because they are not neighboring superpowers, most of the time there is a buffering zone. And nothing can be worse than being in between. I know right now Ukraine is between Russia and NATO. I know from history my country of origin, Romania, used to be between the Ottoman Empire and the Western Empires. Pretty bad place to be, to be in between. Or later on, it was in between Russia or the USSR and the Western Bloc. In between. The problem is when you are in between, you are running the risk of getting it from both parts. Because you are in the buffering zone. And there are some sayings that express that reality. One is between a rock and a hard place. The other one is between a hammer and the anvil. Or, I think this is the most interesting, between the devil and the blue deep. I don't know what that means, but... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's bad. It's bad, right? It's bad. A reality like this can be seen in the book of Daniel chapters... 10 through 12, between a rock and a hard place. Today I'm going to wrap up the book of Daniel, and you may have a, a question in your mind, Pastor Joe, what are you doing? Are you skipping some chapters? Because the last one was from chapter 9. No, I'm not skipping, I'm doing three in one, covering everything from 10 all the way down to 12, through 12. Now, you have to know that this whole section is one single piece, actually. Most of the book of Daniel has the chapter divisions in the right place. Here, the chapter divisions are out of whack in many ways. But I would like to point out first the structure of uh, this one piece of a prophetic description in chapters 10 through 12. First, we have a vision, a vision in which some heavenly being appears, beings appear, and then we have a revelation centerpiece, most of chapter 11 and some of chapter 12, and then there's a final section which comes back, back to the same vision setting that the whole piece starts with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
to be between the rock and the hard place is not an easy reality. And uh, looking at your word, your revelation, we want to see, Lord, how you interact with history and in his history so that you will be there protecting your people, your children that so often are between a rock and a hard place. May your presence through the Holy Spirit lift Jesus Christ up, because in his name we pray, amen. Daniel chapter 10 starts with Daniel fasting for three weeks. Anybody here did a fast for three weeks? Three weeks? All right. So, you know, there are some biological and psychological things that go into that. Three weeks, you have most of the time, if you want to do that, you have some serious background realities that would push you or move you in that direction to refrain for three weeks from food. It seems that Daniel has some background realities going on. Most probably he's still concerned about the vision or the visions he had seen. And uh, he's trying to figure out He's trying to understand how all those things that God revealed to him through a chain of visions apply to the life of his people, maybe to his own life. And verse 5 says, after the three weeks of fasting, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Euphas. So he sees a heavenly, man-like being. Verse 6 continues the description. His body was like beryl. His face like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like torches of fire. His arms and feet like burnished bronze in color. And the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Interestingly, this description here is very similar to a description that you can find in Revelation chapter 1. And in Revelation chapter 1, the person that appears like a high priest, clothed like a high priest, a priest is identified as being Jesus Christ himself. In the book of Daniel, you don't have that name for Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ was going to be born centuries later. But there is a specific name here in the book of Revelation, in the book of Daniel, that tells you who that being is. And that name is Michael or Michael. The description goes on, verse 7, And I, Daniel... Alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision. But a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. So some men were with him. But when he saw the vision, these guys just flee away. Okay? Verse 8 continues. And therefore, says Daniel, I was left alone when I saw this great vision and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty or to ruin, as the Hebrew, in me. And I retained no strength. Verse 9. Yet I heard the sound of his words. And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. So imagine Daniel... On the ground, fainted almost. And then somebody else enters the picture. Verse 10. Suddenly, he said, a hand touched me. A hand touched him, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. Verse 11. 
And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, men greatly beloved. Have you heard anybody greeting Daniel like that before? Telling him he was a man greatly beloved? Of course. O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Who's this guy speaking to Daniel? The same divine messenger that appears in chapter 9. And his name is Gabriel. Gabriel, Michael, all those names have the L, the name of God, in them. Verse 12. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day, watch this, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Let me ask you, when was it that his words were heard? Because now he had been fasting for three weeks. Was it heard? Was he heard at the beginning of his fasting or at the end of his fasting? When you fast and pray for something or have that conversation with the Lord, have your prayer and supplications with the Lord. When does the Lord listen to your supplication and prayer at the beginning or at the end then why doesn't God intervene right away why is it that sometimes you you really have to fast for three weeks or maybe even more and the answer is not coming please notice something here Gabriel says from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard and I have come because of your words. But, but what? Verse 13. But the prince or the sar, the, the commander, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me how many days? How many weeks? Exactly three weeks. Wow. So the, the words of Daniel were heard here, right at the beginning of the three-week fasting. But Gabriel comes to tell him, to talk to him about his problem. Three weeks later, and he says, I would have come... 21 years prior. But the problem is the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, Michael, one of the chief princes. And remember, he was called in Daniel chapter 8, Sar Sarim, the prince of princes. And one of the chief princes came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, please notice something. First, the prince of Persia is mentioned. Prince of Persia, right? And then the kings of Persia are mentioned. And those are two different words. Prince is Sar. And uh, kings is Melek in the Hebrew. And there's a reason why. Because the kings of the Persians... Are human beings or human rulers. The prince of the Persians is not a human being. That's a prince comparable to Prince Michael and comparable to Prince Gabriel. We have here a heavenly ruler that is behind the earthly ruler. And something similar to what happens in Greek mythology, I don't know if you've, you've uh, read the Greek mythology where the gods fight between or among themselves and then humans fight on the ground here. And depending on who wins up here, there are winners down here. 
It's not the exact same scenario, but to compare, you can use that picture. Because it's obvious in this description that while things are happening on the earth, while superpowers or empires succeed one another here on the ground, there are higher realities happening in the heavenly realms. That's why the Apostle Paul says that our fight is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers in the air or in high places. So Gabriel wanted to come right at the time when Daniel started to pray because God wants to answer right away. But the prince of Persia withstood me 21 days. Verse 14. Now I have come after 21 days to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. What vision? Because up to this point, he didn't have anything special in this vision that we, he was having right now. It's the vision, the, the last vision he was dealing with, the vision in chapter 8, that had some explanation in chapter 9. Verse 11. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. Verse 16. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. This seems to be the first heavenly being, the one clothed in high priestly dress. And having the likeness of the Son of Man touched my lips, then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrow or anguish have overwhelmed me and I have retained no strength. So it's not only the fasting. Yes, I have been fasting for three weeks. But it's not only the fasting. What is the problem? It's the sorrow, it's the anguish because of that vision that overwhelmed me and I have retained no strength. Verse 17. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Again, the second heavenly being comes into picture, verse 18. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. Verse 19. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Shalom be to you. That's the word. Shalom be to, be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. Question. When do you say to someone, be strong? When they are weak. Or when something really bad is going to be revealed to them. I remember I was a child when the brother of my grandma, that's an uncle to me, died. He fell off an apple tree, broke his neck, and that was it. His son was in the military, the youngest son. So they sent, I think, a telegraph in those days, or maybe they called, I don't know. Fact is, he was now walking from the bus station toward their house. And a guy was coming the opposite direction, and they met somewhere. I was watching them. I couldn't hear what they were speaking about. 
But when they parted ways, I could hear this other guy tell him something. Be strong, okay? Be strong. Why? Because the reality he was going to be confronted with as he was going to reach his house were overwhelming, very difficult to handle. Verse 20, then he said, do you know why I have come to you? And now I must, or I'm about to return to fight with the prince of Persia. Again, he was fighting with the prince of Persia before. This super being, this heavenly prince of Persia, he was going to continue the fight. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. Oh, so Greece has a prince too. Oh, this is not only fights among empires down here. Russia and the U.S. and no, 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 no. There are higher levels of the fight. You know, this week as, you know, uh, it's Black History Month here in America. I was thinking, you know, how can it be that for centuries slavery happened here in America in a Christian nation? Was it only a fight among the South and the, uh, between the South and the North? Or was it something on a higher level, beyond human and humanness that was taking place? I think both realms were involved. I'm just using this as an illustration of the fact that when we look at reality, we have the impression, okay, these guys have strong muscles and these guys have strong muscles and at one point they may collide, they may challenge, they may provoke one another, they may jump at one another. Yes. But are we aware of the higher sphere of reality? And now, verse 21 ties into chapter 11. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth, says Gab Gabriel to Daniel. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Before, Gabriel said, I was fighting with the prince of Persia. Michael came to help. Here again, I am going back to fight with the prince of Persia. I am going back then to fight with the prince of Greece. No one upholds me against these except who? Michael. And who is Michael? Michael is one of the chief sars or sarim. One of the chief commanders. How can I understand that? Well... Because the commander is not one in a mathematical sense. He's one in somewhat different sense because there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, Michael, your prince, as you have a prince, you have somebody that stands for you as well. Not only enemy princes, you are protected as well. Also in the first year of Darius, the Mede, I, even I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. See this kind of relationship be between Michael or Michael and Gabriel? When Gabriel is in need, Michael comes to help. When Michael is in need, Gabriel comes to help. And here we enter chapter 11. In chapter 11... For a few verses, the picture continues between Persia and then Greece. But then it shifts 
and from east-west, it becomes north-south. North-south, you have the, I don't know what direction is north here. Is north that way? That way? Hey, you are, you are pointing in all directions. <laughs> you, you, you have to decide now. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with my north, okay? This is going to be my north, and this is going to be my south, okay? The description in chapter 11 is that the north pushes toward the south. The south pushes toward the north. And they hit one another. They keep hitting one another. But that's not the full picture. Why? Because in between the north and the south, there is, what is this? It's called the glorious land. Initially, the north, the king of the north, is Syria. The king of the south is Egypt. If you look on a map, in between Syria and Egypt is what? Israel, the glorious land. And the picture is exactly what I said in the beginning. Big world powers fight. They're business. They have muscle. They're strong. The problem is, most of the time in between, there are some others. And when the north pushes toward the south, before hitting the south, what is the north going to hit? The glorious land. When the south pushes back, what is the south going to hit before hitting the north? The glorious land. And that's the story, that's the story of chapter 11. It goes all the way down to the end. On and on, the north hitting the south, the south hitting the north. But interestingly, if you look carefully, you will see that both are on the same side of reality. Both, side, both are on the same side of history. Look at this verse only, verse 27. Both these kings hearts shall be what? Bent on evil. Oh, I thought one was better than the other one. Uh-uh. No. Both of these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil. And they shall speak lies at the same table. Does that sound like politics? <laughs> Just ask him. And they shall, shall speak lies at the same table. Even if you just listen to what people are saying on one side and the other these days. After sitting at the same table, you have the impression they, they, they had a different meal. Right? But it shall not prosper for the end. And the end, again, is in view. So this... Story between the king of the north and the king of the south goes all the way down to the end somehow, in some way of, or form. And the language is pretty coded and cryptic. But there are some very interesting details that I want to point out. For instance, in verse 31, there are three words that we've seen together before. And forces shall be mustered by the king of the north. So the king of the north forces are brought together. And they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. So you have sanctuary. Then they shall take away the daily. You have the daily, the tamid. And place there the abomination of desolation. We've seen desolation before. Where did these three words appear together? Chapter 8. In the description of the little horn, the little horn that appears in chapter 7 as well, the little horn that comes in the wake of the historical Roman Empire. Interesting. Look at verse 35. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the Oh, so again the end is in view. 
because it is still for the appointed time. Verse 36, look at this power. Again, the description is about the king of the north. Then the king of the north shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper how long? Till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. Oh, that sounds very much like the end of chapter 7, where the little horde is destroyed because of the intervention of the heavenly court. Huh. But then we jump a few verses, and with verse 40, we reach the time of the end. It says, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. So now the king of the south attacks the king of the north. What's in between? <laughs> yeah, the glorious land. That's the problem. Look what happens. And the king of the north shall come against him, the king of the south. How? Like a whirlwind. Have you seen a whirlwind? Like a tornado. That's the concept. Or if you are from Florida, it's a hurricane. He shall also enter the glorious land. It's inevitable because the glorious land is in between. And many countries shall be overthrown. Jump to verse 44 and 45. Those are the two final verses in chapter 11. But news from the east and from the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with what? Great fury. It's like the dragon in chapter 12 in the book of uh, Revelation verse 17. Goes with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. Hey, this guy... Is bent on evil, right? And he shall plant the tents of his place between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Again, the same kind of end we've seen in chapter 7 right in the final section. As I said, the language is very coded and cryptic. Because it starts out with a historical setting, the king of the south being Egypt, the king of the north being Syria, and it goes all the way down to the end. What's important to notice, and that's why the angel or Gabriel told Daniel, be strong, be very strong, is that as you Go down through history. Things are going to be more and more difficult. Until you reach a sort of breaking point. But when you reach the breaking point, look what happens. Verse 1 in chapter 12. At that time, and this fury... Of the north king is launched and hits the glorious land or God's people because the glorious land somehow must represent God's people that are in between the forces of evil at the end of the time. At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, which is the people of God. So the same Michael that has been involved throughout history, from the time of the Persians all the way down to the end, the same Michael, the prince of princes, the Sar Sarim, he stands up. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. Let me ask you, is the time of trouble before Michael stands up or after Michael stands up? Hmm? 
When? Before? How many of you say before? How many after? In the passage here, it's obvious that it's after. But don't miss the fact that Michael stands up because of a certain situation. What is the situation? Move it just back one slide. The great fury of the king of the north that wants to destroy and annihilate many. Does that bring about a very difficult time? Of course. For whom? For those in the glorious land. Obviously. But then when Michael stands up, verse 1, who will have that great time of trouble? Those in the glorious land or those on one side and the other of evil? Do you see the biblical picture here? And at that time your people, the text says it, at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. Verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And those are those in the glorious land. Those are your people. Those are God's people that shine and that turn many to righteousness. Verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Never has in the history of humanity knowledge increase, increased the way it is increasing these days. When the radio started at the beginning of uh, the 20th century, people were so surprised, they said it was from the devil. The devil was speaking in the box. When the TV appeared, they said it was the devil himself impersonating people. That's how you can see people in the box. Rapid changes. Knowledge was increasing. When the computer appeared, by the way, I did a research to see when did the first computer appear. I was surprised that there were too many claiming they had the first one. Computer, oh man, that's, that's a, a, a brain in a box. And then I had my first laptop. It was this thick, an IBM. When I first took it home, I was in college, I had a floppy disk. You guys don't know what a floppy disk is. You know there was a DVD one day? Before that, there was a CD. And before that, there was something, it was like a square, called a floppy disk. And I took that floppy disk, put it in there in my laptop. My, my father was there watching me. And I told him, that I have pictures. He was a simple guy from, from the country, you know. A little village out in the middle of nowhere. Never seen computer. Never seen laptops. So I'm telling him that I have on this floppy disk, I have some pictures and uh, some music and a very short video clip. So now I'm going to put it in here and just watch the screen. 
and I put it in, pushed the button, and I said, wow, that's amazing. How can they do this? Knowledge was increasing. Fantastic. But today, from space exploration to genetic engineering or to artificial intelligence, it would be very interesting for me to be able to take this year, my dad passed away three years ago, but this year I would take him to an ABBA concert, the hologram concert, if you know what I'm talking about. Don't take from there that Pastor Joe is from, for ABBA. Okay? <laughs> I just used ABBA because it means daddy as well. But the point is, technology. So you can have a whole band now on stage without having anybody on stage. Uh-huh. Wow. But I have to disappoint you. This is not about that. This is about something else. Because this increasing knowledge comes after Daniel is told, you now shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. Until the time of the end. Because in the time of the end, many shall run to and fro. And that expression translated with running to and fro is a technical expression that expresses what scholars or students of the scrolls, because in those days, you didn't have the codex, okay? The codex, if you want to compare what is written here with something that is written over here, you put your finger here, okay? You turn the page, so we'll not lose. That's how you do it? No, because you have uh, the other one, a scrolling kind of thing. But the point is, in those days, there was no tablets. There was no codexes. I don't know if that's the plural for codex. But anyways, what they had was scrolls. And uh, it wasn't easy to study a scroll. You would literally have to look here, run and see what's written here, and then run back to see what's here, and run to and fro to get the picture. That's how you study prophecy. And it's interesting that this is happening these days because we are in the time of the end in some specific sense. And it's amazing to me that exactly for the sake of studying this chapter 11 from the book of Daniel, not the whole chapter, but specifically the five final verses from 40, well, six, from 40 to 45, there are symposiums where top scholars get together, spend the whole weekend, put hours and hours of exposition in it after tens and hundreds of hours of study, they get together and they do this. Let's see what it means. How can we understand, especially those six verses at the end of chapter 11, things that are happening should be happening, will be happening in the time of the end. And that to me is amazing. But for me and for you, the most important thing, you wouldn't do that to a real scroll. The most important thing is that when things become really bad and things will become really bad, not because of Russia and the USA, 
only, but because there are huge forces and energies involved in this final battle. And in the end, the whole thing goes against the glorious land where God's people is. Be strong, Daniel. Yes, be strong. Be strong, my brother. Be strong, my sister. Yes, be strong. You know what's the most important thing to know here? Is the beginning of chapter 12, verse 1. Chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael... Who is like God? Michael. Mikael. Who is like God? Nobody. Just Jesus Christ. Because he's the, the incarnate prince. Prince of princes. God made man for you and I. So that in the final better, guess what? At that time, when you'll have it the hardest, when you will be between a rock and a hard place, when you will be between the hammer and the anvil, be between the devil and the deep blue, guess what? Michael shall stand up. Amen.